Why, hello, everyone. Leaving for IoT meets blockchain? Shame, shame. So, again, to repeat, what we're talking about today is the Internet of Things and why it does or doesn't need blockchain. So, to speak today are some of the world experts on distributed computing, on how to take data and essentially real-time gather data from it or stream data to it, on how to do micropayments that are absolutely required at rapid speed, and a company building insurance products as a service that you're gonna wanna learn a whole lot about because in all my years in working in the blockchain industry, they may have some of the very best use cases generated thus far. So I'm gonna give everybody an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, first, for those of you who don't know me, this is my third panel of the last two days. My name is David Waxman and I'm the CEO of Waxman, the largest communications firm in blockchain. So I'll let Dominic start. So hello everyone, my name is Dominic Schiener. I'm one of the co-founders of IOTA. So I've been involved in this space since early 2012. And in 2015, we founded IOTA simply to overcome these limitations of blockchain and basically enable this convergence of DLT and IoT because we saw this huge potential for this machine economy. Great, thank you. Henry. Hey, hey, I'm Henry, co-founder of Streamer. Streamer is a decentralized real-time data protocol for transporting, sharing, monetizing, and crowd-selling data streams. Uh, IoT is one of the main use cases for us, uh, in addition to financial data streams, um, user interactions with all kinds of applications, and so on. Gilles? Hi, everyone. So my name is Gilles Fedak. I'm CEO and co-founder of uh, iExec. Uh, before that, I was a researcher in computer science at INRIA. So at iExec, we are building a decentralized marketplace for computing resources. Uh, it allows anyone to monetize their application, their servers, or uh, their data. Fantastic. Hello, so my name is Olivier. Uh, I'm the CEO of La Parisienne Assurance, a very old uh, French name. But what we are, we are a full stack uh, property and casualty insurer. Well, what we do, we deliver um, white-labeled insurance products to all kinds of distributors. And the way we do it is that uh, we deliver um, our product through a portal of API backed by a blockchain. Um, and um, in 2018, now we got into the top 20 uh, property and casualty insurers. And we have a very uh, heavy use of all kind of triggers for policies and claims, um, partly using IoT, which I will talk about later. Fantastic. So let's get to the fundamental question. First, does IoT need blockchain, or is it basically a luxury, or just an unnecessary thing to, to taking two fads and throwing them together? Why don't we start with you, Dominic? Uh, IoT needs blockchain, blockchain is IoT, right? So Blockchain is IoT. <laughs> right, but it, I mean, blockchain really needs IoT, really is machines that, so why does blockchain need IoT, right? So it fundamentally has solved half of the problem, right? So how can I make sure that they have a, a database structure that is immutable? So that means the data that you get in, into the blockchain will be immutable, right? But how do you ensure that the data that you get is actually valid? And how do you actually ensure that uh, the private keys of your wallet are actually secured, right? So that is why blockchain really needs IoT in the sense of hardware, right? The, 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 the hardware is really an, an intrinsic component to make blockchain scalable to, for the hardware acceleration, for the security component, right? And to, to answer your question, why does blockchain need out of right as IoT need the blockchain is really this fundamental trust problem that we have in IoT. Like we we are, we we see all of these cyber attacks that are happening that are really causing harm to our um, mission critical infrastructure. And now what blockchain really adds to that is really this trust component that I can really trust the data that they have received from these machines and that I can also verify it myself. And then added to that is really this uh, economic component that I can really transfer value, right? I can transfer uh, transactions machine to machine. And this really unleashes this, this new uh, uh, potential, new, new economies, right? And let's, let's save some of those use cases for just a little later because I definitely want to talk about that. So, Henry. Does IoT need blockchain? Is it just for security? Is it, is it for something more? Is the transaction of value uh, what's really critical? Is it, or is it better to transact data? For IoT to work, 
it must network, right? We can't have the promise of IoT, which is basically making new kinds of data available to, to, uh, to end up in silos, right? The real promise of IoT comes from interoperability. And if these silos uh, can't communicate, we can say goodbye to these nice ideals okay, like so smart cities and so on. Let's, right? let's talk a little bit about that a little bit more. Um, so what do you mean by silos? Are you saying well, just items the, in one home? What, what, yeah, break I it mean, down. Okay, so uh, what does IoT sound like to the, to the layman, right? They think of connected devices that send data to the internet, right? Wait, the internet? What is that? What, what, what place is the internet? Where does it actually go on the internet? Well, it goes to an IoT platform, it goes to a, a, a cloud platform, but these things don't really talk to each other. You got vendor lock-in, you got um, lack of shared protocols that could be used for data, data sharing. Um, so you end up in this very fragmented universe that doesn't really deliver on the pro on at least on all the promises of IoT. If you put your data into a silo, you're basically placing a, a lid, a cap on the value that that data can have. So to uh, to con uh, to counteract this, we need decentralized technologies that can um, act as kind of vehicles for that data to make that data more available, more usable, and to really give rise to the data economy um, um, that, that is kind of fueled by I IoT. So let's talk a little bit about the data economy, uh, which you, you bring up. So if IoTs are essentially sources or oracles, can we call them that a little bit of data? And perhaps trusted oracles of data because they are the direct source. They're telling me the temperature of inside of a truck. They're telling me the speed that my truck is going. They're telling me if my truck is actually in one place as opposed to another. Um, and this allows for, let, let's call them use cases or applications to be built. And that's what I'm really interested in. I think what the audience is really interested in is those actual use cases that IoT can deliver and can deliver better with blockchain. So I want to talk about some of those. And insurance products are one of them. Because insurance products are also, a little bit like blockchain, a means to an end. Although it is certainly what your organization delivers, you're offering right now, today, insurance products based on blockchain for companies that this audience knows well. Can you talk a little bit about that, Olivier? Sure, sure. Well, I totally agree with what you said. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, basically, IoT collects data, and there needs to be something to be on the other hand to collect that data. I mean, compute that data, automate that data. So, if you look at uh, uh, in a macro way about what is our job as an insurer, I mean, uh, we need triggers. Uh, which means that we need events that are collected by some ways, and the sensors, the IoT sensors are the best way to collect these data so that we can start an insurance policy, finish an insurance policy, or also pay a claim. So to talk about like real use cases that we're doing, I mean, our, our blockchain uh, today has like tens of thousands of policies of smart contracts in it, and it's growing at a pace of 10% per month. And uh, so real use cases of what we do, for example, we do on-demand motor insurance. I mean, we have an IoT sensor. Uh, it's when the car starts, we, uh, we provide own damage policy on-demand by the second. We stop the policy when the IoT sensor senses the information that the car has stopped. We do flood insurance where uh, the IoT sensor gives us the information if there's some humidity and we can provide, uh, I mean, claims payment based on this sensor. So every day, for us, it was a real game changer. And, uh, and blockchain was the um, compulsory other party of the IoT sensors because we needed two things. Uh, because of transaction costs, uh, we needed to automate all these policies because, of course, these are micro transactions with micro premiums. So if you have tens of euros of administrative costs behind, it just doesn't work. Uh, but by doing this on the blockchain with automated sensors through the IoT network is actually reduced to cents. So we've divided at least by 10. And that's what allows us to do, for example, for people like uh, Uber uh, or a company like this, we do on-demand motor TPL, which is third-party liability, for the drivers by the shift. So we are directly connected into the app. We have the information from the shift. So I know this is not an IoT sensor by itself, but it's the same concept. We get a trigger. And so all the products that we're developing now are based either on sensors with IoT 
or based on triggers that comes from private index or public index. If I can add up just something very quick, because uh, I'd like to introduce into the concept also uh, the importance for us about the network uh, between the sensors, between the IoT and the blockchain. Uh, because for me, uh, we're looking at five, four or five different things into the network. Wait, so between the IoT sensors yes, and which the is, blockchain? Which, which network are we using? Uh, because, I mean, we need uh, to talk about money. The transaction cost needs to be low. We need power. It needs the sensors need to be a low consumption of energy. Uh, we need spectrum. We need narrow band network. Uh, and, and you need uh, reach because uh, it needs to be accessible from everywhere. If not, the, just the use case just doesn't work. So, for example, we've connected uh, our back end with an IoT data hub. Uh, we're using the Sigfox network that you probably know. That is a French company using a zero G network to transfer the data that's coming from the sensor. And this is extremely important because I think in the equation, you need the sensors, the IoT, you need the blockchain, and you need the network of the middle that for us must have these like qualities, which is basically money, power, spectrum, and reach. But so, so utilizing Sigfox is just for the machine connecting to a gateway, and then a gateway is connected to the blockchain? Exactly, that's what we do. And have what blockchain are you currently running on? Well, we, for the moment, we're using a, a, a private blockchain. Uh, we're using the technology uh, developed by Chain.com, but that now has merged with a, a private protocol, Stellar. Um, because for the moment, we're just using automation. Um, the next step of our uh, technical roadmap is that we're going to move to record keeping which is really splitting the insurance premium between the final consumer, the distributor that gets a commission, the insured that gets a premium, and the reinsured that gets a share of the premium. And for this, we really need decentralized governance, so we need to move to a public blockchain, but we haven't chosen the protocol for the moment. We are in the process of choosing the protocol. Sounds like an exciting RFP process. So a lot of these devices that we're talking about that exist, they're quite small. Some of them are maybe sophisticated, but are quite small. And they can't do everything by themselves. This is one place where a distributed compute network like iExec could be so helpful. Can you explain a little bit how something that could be used in one way to render enormous, let's call it graphic files, or to do essentially compute, distributed computing for as a supercomputer as a service, which is one thing iExec can be used for, how is it applicable to IoT? Yeah, so at iExec, we're doing um, a decentralized marketplace for computing power. So that means that if you have a small device, which is an IoT uh, device, so typically, as you mentioned, usually power consumption is the key factor. So you really need not to consume any power. So typically, what you want is that if you have some high demanding computation, you want to find uh, computing resources resource not too far from you, typically, to you know, maintain a low connection, a good connection uh, link. And, and typically, this is where iExec um, you know, uh, is a good offer, because you will go on the blockchain, emit an order. This order will be settled on the blockchain. Thanks to this, some servers can be uh, provisioned to execute the computation. And because the infrastructure is uh, highly distributed, then you can find really the machine you want with the capacity you want at the closest distance, network distance, uh, that is required by your device. So yeah, I think this is the kind of infrastructure that is needed for IoT. Well, one of the other challenges with IoT, as Henry was mentioning earlier, is that currently, it's a very closed network very often. these de It's device by device. So if I'm all Samsung, maybe I'm locked into Samsung as a vendor, um, or anyone else, whether it's Sony or Ford, and we'll get into driverless cars later because that's something I think everyone's excited about. But ecosystem development is something that IOTA has been famous for. You guys have done an unbelievable job of getting some of the major players and important players, including startups, involved in something where they can share common language. Can you talk about why that's important? Kind of some of the stuff you've done? Right, so, so we were talking about silos before, and, and basically what we have today is really a fragmented ecosystem where those companies in consortias or in their own setup are enabling those machines to communicate with each other and enable those business use cases, right? 
but we are really talking about the machine economy where one machine can pay another machine for the data or pay another machine for the computation, right? And as such, when you have an open ecosystem that is actually interoperable, right? And this is where I, why we always argue for that it's very important that we have one standard that is, or one protocol that's going to be a standard, right? So that's going to be adopted by the entire industry and industries. A uh, good example uh, is, for example, EV charging, where we have six different standards today. Uh, for the EV charging plugs, and that means that we have this fragmented ecosystem, and it, it's really a burden for the co end consumers because now I need to figure out, hey, can I even charge there? And the same is going to happen in the future if we like going to a gas station, but they simply don't have the right type of petrol. Yeah, exactly, and and it's it's really a burden for users, right? And the consumers pay because the companies were competing with different standards, right? And and this is why it's very important that when it comes to IoT, we we don't uh, start tokenizing all of these different assets, because then in the end, at the end of the day, our machines will become forex traders. So right? so we shouldn't tokenize all the assets. You heard it here first from a blockchain co-founder. Uh, we should not tokenize everything. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us why? So you think it'll become forex trading, and that what adds overhead? Yeah, exactly. Like it, it, adds a, it adds a lot of overhead, and actually means that the integration costs uh, increase and the maintain maintenance costs increase exponentially, right? Because I need to integrate this protocol, that protocol, and we are talking about really low power devices that don't have much capacity, and as such, it's really fragmenting the ecosystem, and it's making it very difficult for these machines to actually operate. So, on uh, a small follow-up there, why does IOTA's protocol? Why is it able to work better with low power, small devices with low compute, uh, and for instance, both fast enough and secure enough for those yeah. applications? So, so what we focus on is really making IOTA very lightweight. And IOTA does one thing and one thing really well, which is just transactional settlement, right? We don't have any state transitions. We don't have any small contracts yet. But our focus is really machine-to-machine -machine payments and this data security part so that machines can uh, really transfer data and, and, and secure it and share it with other party, uh, parties. And the promise of IOTA is, is that it's a very different architecture. It no longer utilizes a blockchain. Uh, we have some bottlenecks right now with the coordinator, which we are uh, working tirelessly on, on removing. But the promise is really that we have a new system and a new network that is really scalable, and we really hope to be the first permissionless ledger that is actually enterprise ready. And this is the tangle, of course. Yeah, exactly. So this is the tangle. Because t today we are fragmenting the ecosystem again because companies are forced to utilize private networks, like you, for, you, you guys, for example, right? And that means that we are again in this area where a company needs to set up a consortium, and then other companies say, like, I don't want to join your consortium, I want to do my own. Right, and that's why permissionless ledgers are so crucial for unlocking this potential of IoT. And just to say it, there have been a number of consortia established by some very large organizations, and unfortunately, one of the things you'll read as you parse through the news is that a lot of companies aren't joining theirs. Everyone's worried about joining their competitors' consortium, uh, and consequently, nobody's getting along. So, on a different note, but with a similar theme, some people, certainly on the fora, wrongly compare Streamer and IOTA. I think you guys do very, very different things. Henry, would you mind kind of defining what the difference is? I mean, certainly IoT, as you mentioned, is just one use case, but I think you're solving different problems with very different technology solutions. Yeah, so Streamer is for data transport and that, that only, basically. So you could think of it as, you know, maybe BitTorrent for data streams instead of static files. So how Streamer works is that it interoperates with a companion blockchain, which today is Ethereum, but it could be something different um, for the things such as payments and um, storing permissions and this other kind of things that need like strong consensus. Whereas we see that the data itself doesn't need that kind of global consensus because it can be secured with um, a little bit more lightweight cryptography, uh, your usual cryptography, like data signing, data encryption, that kind of stuff. So that makes the data delivery network uh, very lightweight and very fast, whereas the slower blockchain is a good complement for that. So the big difference is that the streamer network carries only data, not payments, whereas IOTA, for example, can carry payments. So we're kind of doing this dualistic, best of both worlds approach, whereas IOTA is ambitiously covering both. 
So thank you very much for that. And you, you mentioned the huge volumes of data. So I don't know if everyone here fully appreciates just today how huge the IoT ecosystem is. How much data can anyone here approximate is currently output by IoT devices? I mean, it's got to be, what, terabytes, petabytes a day today? Yeah, for sure, for sure. And that's only going to increase over time. So how, how do you build a protocol, or anything for that matter, that can handle that type of bandwidth requirements? That's where the peer-to-peer -peer mechanisms come in. So obviously no single source, like, like a sensor, like a battery-powered little sensor, they could never deliver the data to like millions of recipients. So that's why we need uh, the scalability that the peer-to-peer -peer networks can offer, so that the data goes somewhere, from there it goes to the peers, goes to other peers, and gets distributed to everyone who's interested um, in that data. Uh, as long as some, um, in addition to also some storage facilities or, or whatnot is required in the picture. So Olivia, how many devices, so to speak, or let's say uh, instances, is your insurance company servicing at any given well, that, time? That's a good question. I mean, uh, we've never counted, but uh, what I can tell you is that the private network that we're using is actually eight or nine million uh, devices uh, communicating on the network. So I know their numbers. I mean, our number is obviously growing exponentially uh, every month. Uh, I would say I would say probably already hundreds of thousands, uh, but it's the, it's the beginning. Uh, so, but I agree with you. I mean, there's no way. I mean, that power can be centralized. So, so it has to be somehow some kind of decentralized. Uh, I mean, infrastructure. Uh, even if now, I mean, there's some part of the technical chain that, if you put it in the cloud, I mean, if you're using service cloud services, uh, you, I mean, you, you can still do it for some bit of the technical chain. Yeah, and it's important to understand that um, when, when talking about power, we don't only mean that the technical power, but also the, the kind of control over the data, right? Mm -hmm. This is why, yeah. I mean, I guess one of the internet giants like Google or Amazon, they could set up like a data pay pipeline for insurance or whatever, but, but at the same time, they would have effectively control over all of that data, like they already have today to our personal data and the whole like current business model of the internet, which is basically like selling, selling your data to advertisers. And this, this can be changed. I don't know if it can be changed for, for personal data, but we'll certainly try. But especially for the machine economies, it, it simply cannot work um, with centralized players. And I think that's why it hasn't happened yet. That's why we're still waiting for the breakthrough of IoT. That's why IoT needs blockchain, that it cannot happen with centralized uh, players because they would get excessive power. Yeah, but if, it, if uh, sorry, uh, just one thing. This, I think there's also a myth that we should break, is that, that all, not all the transactions need to be real time. Because, I mean, uh, even for use cases that are, that I mean, we develop, I mean, every day, I mean, you don't really need real time uh, computation of the data and everything. Uh, so if you really reduce uh, the amount of the transactions that come from the sensors and that you accept, that you can build amazing use cases, even if you don't have real-time computation of your triggers and your data, which is 99% of the time the case. Uh, so except for maybe bank transaction, turbo transfers, things like this. But even for insurance, I mean, I don't need to have total real-time transactions. So if you add up some kind of centralization of the power, plus the fact that you break that myth of total real-time, and you're very careful about what you embed into the sensors is extremely small in terms of bytes that go through the network. I think we'll still have some time to go uh, to build amazing use cases. So, but that's uh, the reality check. Of course, technically, it would be much better to find the breakthrough so that we have the solution. But the reality check is that we can still work with what's going on now, technically. So one, one point, like all of us have to understand that the Internet of Things is not about the Internet, right? It's really mesh networks, it's clusters of devices that communicate with each other with a different protocol, right? And as such, if we want to enable these use cases that we are talking about, we need to have a different way to settle 
and clear these transactions. And as such, that, that is the main reason why cryptocurrency for IT really makes sense. It removes this trust problem and it actually enables the use cases because without such a system, there will be no machine to machine payments because the machine itself cannot communicate with the uh, bank API and say like, hey, please transfer money. Not right? to mention the transactions would be tiny. Yeah. You, not everything is gonna be $3 or five euros. Yeah, exactly. So, and the load will be enormous, right? And so, we already today have congestion problems with the network. And so, now we're talking about billions of devices that want to transact. And that only can only work with a distributed ledger. All right. Well, so I really want to make sure we get into this driverless cars. It's absolutely the way the future goes. And my prediction, and I don't like making predictions, is that within 15 years, it will be illegal to drive your own car. <laughs> anyway, for driverless cars to work, Good thing I don't have a driver's license. <laughs> Good. You're ahead of your time. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Don't you Parents know, Elon people. Musk said the other day that cars are, I mean, Teslas are now appreciating assets instead of depreciating assets. Wow. Because you can earn by having a car, so you should consider. Uh, he's so good at communication. <laughs> <laughs> he's a master. So let's, getting into driverless cars, obviously the future. It, they are literally a lot of devices connected to each other that allow for this vehicle to travel at dozens of kilometers per hour. And they're very, very heavy. They're very dangerous. The great fear of everyone is that Skynet or someone, a malicious actor, might hack them. Truly, would blockchain help secure this? Or is, is that a myth? Yeah, so so that's that's the whole promise, right? So a blockchain really enables a secure way to manage your infrastructure, right? So we talk about remote control of your infrastructure, and already today there is some very interesting use case that we're doing with factories, right? Controlling the factory robot robotics and stuff like that, and the same will happen will with these decentralized fleets. There will not be a a single command and control center where you can now autonomously check all cars, right? There will be policy management in the vehicle itself that will can be checked on a blockchain to continuously, right, to see if it's going right. And through that, you can really make sure that the car does what it's not doesn't do what it's not supposed to do, right? And this is where blockchain really has a lot of potential to add a lot of security. But also the use cases, right? Mobility as a service that you can pay, uh, uh, be part of the fleet by investing in it, buying a Tesla, or just buying a stake in it, and then the car charging money for going from A to B. So those are really the most exciting use cases. And obviously, we talk about smart cities, and smart cities is not just one specific aspect of it. It's really how these machines in itself really act in symbiosis. And the vehicle itself is a very important component there because the vehicle has to speak with the infrastructure, has to buy and sell data that it continuously gets, and, and so on and so forth. So there's a very exciting use case with autonomous vehicles. And adding to that, I mean, cars are special in the sense that they roam the environment, right? So they can offer not only mobility services, but also gather all kinds of data from the surroundings, like detecting uh, conditions of the road, potholes and whatnot, traffic, m measure pollution, weather, um, <coughs> network signal strength, all kinds of things while they roam the universe. And this is another thing that adds to the ability of this kind of connected devices to actually become appreciating assets that they can earn revenue streams by collecting and monetizing this data um, that, that they can uh, gather. So if you, had, if you had like a choice between two cars, one of them lets you earn money and offset some of the costs of the car, and the other one is just an old dumb car that doesn't do this, which car do you buy? Of course, you buy the car that allows you to, to earn money with, with that ownership. Because I'm gonna go and hook my car up to iExec and rent out its compute power, is that right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so you, you can rent your, the data coming from your car, generated by your cars through the iExec platform. Exactly, this is what we're doing. We're doing that using uh, all layers of security, in particular uh, hardware uh, on clay. This is something uh, important. Just to come back at uh, the discussion we had before around uh, identity, uh, I mean, not sorry, security and blockchain, and those blo can blockchain uh, you know, solve the security problem for IoT. I think it will if uh, it's standardized. And we are only at the early beginning of standardization effort for that. Uh, there have been a couple of uh, working groups um, uh, initiated by IEEE in the US, and that's something really important. We participate to some of them. 
Um, and so, yeah, there is here a common effort from everyone to, you know, not build only the technology, but also the, the standard that can be adopted by the industry. Fantastic. And finally, will your insurance company be providing insurance for my driverless car in the future? Of course, we will do. And uh, to use a buzzword, but that I like, I mean, the way we see blockchain in the insurance industry is like a new service called TAS. It's trust as a service. And, uh, and of course, it needs standardization. Of course, it's still an emerging technology. Of course, uh, it will need a lot of consortiums to move ahead. But yes, we will provide insurance for uh, the driverless uh, uh, cars. And uh, honestly, we use blockchain as a service, as a trustful service. I mean, we should never forget, I think, why blockchain has been put together after the financial crisis. It's because there was a trust crisis against private uh, organization. And we needed some kind of automated third uh, party that could be a trustful party. And that's the way we see blockchain in general. That's the way we use it. And with billions of devices yes, coming online, of course connected. we're going to need that type of trustlessness. Absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.